Well, I've had, this, I've had this message in my heart for the past couple weeks, and I know it's from the Lord, but the title is Discerning and Being Delivered from the Religious Spirit. Discerning and Being Delivered from the Religious Spirit. You might say, Landon, what is a religious spirit? You know, like there's churches that are, you know, religious. There's different religions out there. What is the religious spirit? I want to break it down because I believe this spirit is one of the most deadly spirits that destroys churches every year. This spirit, his, his plan is to divide and conquer, divide and conquer the church. And we're going to walk through what this looks like. We're also going to be pray, praying over people who have been hurt from this spirit in other churches in the past. That have experienced spiritual abuse that have experienced hurt and pain from other people in other churches. And there's some people here that a long time ago, you were hurt and you promised, I'll never go back to the church. But you're here today. And I just believe that God's going to bring a lot of healing from what's happened in the, per in the past. Amen? So I just want to preference this by saying this. My heart today is not to attack people, but to expose a spirit. I'm not here to attack people. I want to expose this religious spirit so that way when it pops its head up, you go, I know exactly what this thing is. You ever walked into a church and just something didn't feel right? Like, I can't put my finger on it. I'm just not sure. Something didn't feel right. Majority of nine times out of ten, it's probably a religious spirit. You know, the, the number one spirit that I think Jesus encountered the most was the religious spirit. And it was found in the Pharisees and Sadducees. Isn't it crazy that people that could recite the Old Testament word from word, they knew all the prophetic words of the Messiah coming, but when the Messiah was right in front of them, he couldn't, they couldn't even recognize who he was. A religious spirit will blind you to who Jesus is and what he wants to do. Amen. Amen. So this is what a religious spirit is. A religious spirit is a type of demonic spirit that influences a person, a group of people to replace a genuine relationship with God with works and traditions. When people operate out of a religious spirit, they attempt to earn salvation. This evil spirit has established non-biblical beliefs and customs for generations. We know the enemy is an angel of light attempting to counterfeit any of God's good or perfect gifts, to enforce the cause chaos, confusion, shame, and guilt. And he does this through the religious spirit. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 14 says this, for such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no wonder for Satan himself transforms himself as an angel of light. The religious spirit transforms himself as an angel of light, and he's found in most churches today. Not all of them, but a lot of them. I want you to know that today, people will be delivered from the spirit of religion. Amen? Amen. Amen. They're going to be delivered from work mindsets. Well, if I could just do this more, God would love me more. You know, you're saved by grace, not by works. Amen. Jesus already did the work on the cross. Amen? Amen. People are going to be set free from past church hurt and spiritual abuse. And the religious spirit has three cousins. Everybody say three cousins. Three cousins. The cousins are pride, criticism, and slander. When you walk into a church and you sense pride in some of the people there, criticism, well, if I was in charge, this is what I would do. And slander, through the religious spirit, sounds really spiritual. Well, you know what? We just really need to pray for this person right now. You're just gossiping about them and making it sound spiritual. Has anybody ever heard this before? All right. I, there's a lady that goes to my dad's church. Her and her whole family, they, um, when I was youth pastors. Chris and I were youth pastors in Dallas, Texas. One week, this, her kids came to our church. They began to have an encounter with God on Wednesday nights in our youth service. She came, and she had an encounter with God, too. She gave her life to the Lord. Her kids gave her life to the Lord. Her husband came. He gave his life to the Lord. And now the kids that were in our youth group, one of them is a campus pastor in Florida. God's using this family. This lady, she, um, you know, remember Jason Cantell who spoke a while back? 
Jason Cattell has a real estate team. She's one of the realtors on our team, and God's blessing her like crazy. But when she got saved, she had this conversation with Chris and I one day. She goes, you know, I've been going to church for 10 years, but I realized I had a relationship with the church. I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. With the religious spirit, it tricks you into thinking that you're good with Jesus, but really you just have a relationship with the church. I want you to know just because you go to church doesn't mean you're automatically going to heaven. Just because you tithe doesn't mean you're automatically going to heaven. Just because you serve doesn't mean you automatically go to heaven. The Bible even says there's going to be people that, that stand before me and say, Jesus, we cast out demons in your name. We healed the sick in your name. And he's going to say, I'm sorry, I never knew you. Even if you go to heaven, you say, but Jesus, look, I have perfect attendance every Sunday. I was at church every Sunday. He can still come back and say, I appreciate you coming to church but you never had a relationship with me. Just because you go to church doesn't mean you're a Christian. Just like I can go to the gym, I'm not automatically a bodybuilder. I know that might shock some of you guys because I'm like, hey. But the religious people will trick people into thinking, if I check this off the box, I'm good. And here's the mindset. Just like people get life insurance. I'm getting life insurance in case I die. I know my family's gonna be taken care of. Some people have the mindset, I'm going to go to church. In case I die, I know I'm going to go to heaven. But the truth of the matter is, listen, you personally have to have a relationship with Jesus. Amen? And I just really believe that as I'm walking through this, we're going to talk about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and God might speak this to you. You might discover that there is a Pharisee in you. But there's a Sadducee in you. That's what God spoke to me one day. I was listening to a message, and I was getting all uncomfortable. I didn't like the message. I was getting angry at the person speaking. I wanted to leave. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Landon, there's a Pharisee in you. As I walk through this, if you begin to feel uncomfortable, not always, but sometimes that means that God wants to set you free from this religious spirit. Amen. Amen. So the devil controls churches and saints through this spirit. I believe Jesus wasn't killed by the world. He was killed by this spirit of religion. Pharisees and Sadducees, they are the, even the ones that paid Judas the betrayal money to betray Jesus. The characteristics of this spirit is pride, arrogance, control, criticism, very critical people. You know what? God, criticism isn't one of the gifts of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's love, joy, peace, patience, not criticism, not critical people. If there's somebody who's always dealing with control, always critical, always arrogant, always prideful, you might be dealing with a religious spirit. A slandering, always talking bad about other people. Um, the religious spirit has a mentality, um, and this is the mentality here. You know how when people retire, at, you know, they've worked their whole life, and they retire, and they go, hey, we're just going to enjoy life, we're going to coast, and we're going to live life, and it's going to be great. The religious spirit has the same process. Once you've been a believer for X amount of years, you can sit back and coast into heaven. I want you to know that you might retire from your career, but you won't retire from God's calling. And I want to run into heaven, running into heaven. I don't want to coast into heaven. I don't want to barely get into heaven. I want to bust heaven open <laughs> and carry people with me. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So there is no retirement for a believer. I heard somebody say some people, they live for retirement. Believers live for eternity. My heart is I want to bring as many people to heaven with me as I can. If I'm breathing, if you're breathing, you got a calling. If you're breathing, you got a plan. I want everybody to put your hands up. Look at your hand. Look at your fingerprint. Look at your fingerprint. Do you see your fingerprint? It might be kind of dark in here for some people. You're the only one with this fingerprint. God meticulously created your fingerprint because he knew he called you for something great. 
I think I said this a couple of days ago at a teaching. You know, every year there are one million babies aborted. One million babies. The fact that you're still alive is God saying, I've got a mighty plan for your life. For real. Every day, I'm putting perspective here, guys. I'm putting perspective because what I want to do is create a fire in you. Every day, 100,000 people go into eternity. Every day, 100,000 people. Every day, 700,000 people this past year went into eternity, heaven or hell, one or the other. The spirit of religion would say, hey, take your time. There doesn't need to be an urgency in your heart to follow God. You've got your whole life. The spirit of religion will paralyze you and get you so comfortable. You just sit back and, and you're the one that just like, hey, I'm just going to go to church. I'm just going to live. But I tell you what, when you get the Holy Spirit in you, there's a fire that's ignited. And there's something in you that says, hey, we don't have much time left. I got to do something for the Lord. I got to do something for the Lord. When you rebuke a spirit of religion and you truly relieve the whole feel and get filled with the Holy Spirit, there's a fire that starts to burn inside of you. Come on, somebody. If there's not a fire inside of you, I'm saying this in love, but if, not, if there's not a fire inside of you, something's wrong. And we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit and where he plays in our life. All right. I had this vision that God gave me because he, the devil's doing a great job of dividing the body of Christ. This is a kind of harsh vision to listen to but this is what i saw i saw a parent two parents and they had a little kid i feel the anointing right now and the devil took the kid put his arm on a table had a sword and chopped off the kid's arm mom dad save me help me save me help me and the Lord, I heard the Lord say, this is what the devil and the spirit of religion is doing to my body. This is what he's doing to my kid. I want you to know, God does not like division. There's a guy that pastors a church in New York. He helps a lot of homeless people, drug addicts, alcoholics get back on their feet. And he said this to him the other day. Um, he, he was talking, I think my dad told me this story about him, but he said, listen, if you fall off the wagon, you get into drugs, you fall back into alcohol, he goes, we're going to be the first ones that come alongside you, we're going to pick you up, we're going to get you back established, we're going to walk with you. But he says, but if you're here and you begin to cause division, we're going to ask you to leave. If you're operating under the religious spirit causing division, he says, I'm sorry, you're not welcome here. God does not like people destroying, dividing his bride. And he's coming back for a bride. He is coming back for a bride. He's very protective. Jesus is very protective over his bride. All right, let's keep going. A religious people, spirit will trick people into thinking that church is another box that they need to check off of their weekly to-do list. Matthew 23, 27, this is Jesus talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees. It says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. He's being really loving right now. Wait, no, isn't God love? God is, isn't Jesus love? He just called him a hypocrite. We need to love people. Yeah, we need to love people. You need to speak the truth as well. He wasn't necessarily talking to the person. I think he was talking to the controlling spirit behind them. And he says, you are like whitewashed tombs, which looked beautiful on the outside, but on the inside you're full of um, bones of dead and unclean things. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to be people of righteousness, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. It's really easy as a believer today to call yourself a Christian, but on the inside, we're the farthest thing from it. I heard this in prayer as I put this message together. God said a lot of people, they don't go to church so that God would change their life. 
They go to church to comfort their consciousness. I heard a guy say this a couple days ago. He said the devil couldn't beat the church, so he joined it, and he called it religion. I saw a vision. I was putting this message together. There's people in line to go to church. They are all in line, but as they got to their front doors, the pastor met them there, and their hands like this. And one by one, he put handcuffs in their, on their wrists and said, welcome to church. As he put the handcuffs on, he said, don't raise your hands. Don't lay your hands on anybody. Keep your hands down. Stay quiet. This is not a place of freedom. This is a prison. The religious spirit will turn every church into a prison. How do you know if a religious spirit's ruling over a church? Are people being set free? Are people being saved? Are people being healed? And are people being delivered? If those things are not happening, more than likely there's a religious spirit over the church. When, it's like Jay Kale said a couple, like last week. Was it last week he was here? Man, last week was so powerful. Jake Kale said either WWJD, what would Jesus do? If he was here, he'd be doing the same thing he was doing before. Healing the sick, raising the dead, you know, casting out demons. Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing also? You know why we're not doing, why we're not seeing so many churches do it? Spirit of religion. So I want to share with you four ways you can recognize and discern the spirit of religion and cast it out. Number one, religion paralyzes the saints with fear, control, and competition. Fear is one way that the spirit of religion controls people, a fear of man. What are people going to think if I go up front and I raise my hands? What are people going to think if I walk over to them in the grocery store and I can pray for them? What are people going to think? What are people going to... At some point, you have to allow God to break the fear of man out of your life. You, God cannot use you if man's voice is louder than his voice. I'm being for real. Some people are like, God, use me. God, use me. God, use me. And then fear of man begins to creep in. You're like, next time. Next time, Lord. I'm sorry, not this next time. God wants to break off a spirit of fear, amen, and give boldness like he gave to Goli David and Goliath. Man, David had boldness. Man, we need boldness. Thank you, Jesus. Fear is, is the way that a lot of leadership are leading the churches through fear. It's not through compassion. It's not through love. It's through fear, and it's all through, through, also through control. I'm about to hit another whack-a-mole here. Stay with me. I want you to know this, that any denomination that says that only the priest can read the Bible is wrong. The Catholic Church, I'm not talking about all Catholics, but a lot of them, they'll tell the believers, you can't read the Bible because you don't understand it. You allow me to read the Bible. That's wrong, church. That is wrong. And they even say, you're not spiritual enough to do your own prayers. I need you to repeat these prayers after me. I want to tell you this too. Read this verse, John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said to him, this is what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me and Mother Mary. No, he said, I'm the only way you get to heaven. Can I tell you, not only is praying to Mother Mary and other saints wrong, it's demonic. It's demonic. I'm telling you right now. The Bible says don't pray to the dead. You pray to the Father through the name of Jesus. Amen? This is witchcraft happening in churches every week. How do you know this, Landon? Because we're doing deliverance sessions with people coming out of the Catholic Church and demons are coming out of them. Let me preface it by this. I believe there's a mighty move of God happening and it's going to increase in the Catholic Church. I believe there are Catholic, Catholic hostels, I think that's what they call them, 
filled with the Holy Spirit. But I want to tell you this. If you're praying to saints and you're praying to Mother Mary, that is wrong. Don't do that. That will open up doors in your life for demons to come in. I know that's the first mall off like I was supposed to hit. Lord, okay, I covered that one. <laughs> first Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God, and there is one meteor between God and man, and the man's name is Christ Jesus. He's the person you pray to. He's the person you pray to. Amen? Amen. Parents, be careful if you're sending your kids to a Catholic church and they're saying these prayers. You say, Landon, that's harsh. I'm just being honest. We've had five kids delivered from demons in the past two or three months. Kids. I'm not up here to be popular. I just want to speak the truth. I want to see God raise up a church that the gates of hell won't prevail against. And there's been such a mixture. There's been such a mixture of wrong theology. And because we don't want to offend anybody, we just ice around certain issues in the Bible. Jesus straight up called the Pharisees hypocrites. You think he was concerned? You think the word hypocrite offended somebody? Was like a compliment? Whoa, thank you, Jesus. Wow. <laughs> he was straightforward. I had a conversation with a Lutheran youth pastor a couple years ago. He said, Landon, when Chris and I were youth pastors here, he said, I see your youth group, and God's growing it, and you have a lot of high school students. He said, we've got a lot of middle school students, but we don't have any Harley high school students. And he says, it seems like after confirmation, all the students leave, and they never come back to church. I want to say something, that I, and I say this in love, but I want to say this. We got to, especially with the Lutheran church, we, we, we have to be careful because the issue is there's a mindset that says once I'm confirmed, I no longer need Jesus or need to go to church. And there's a mindset that goes along with this that's once saved, always saved, which I do not believe in. I'm going to show the scriptures of why I don't believe in once saved, always saved. Okay? Here's the reason. The religious spirit is using this theology to allow people to coast their whole life and they're going to stand before God and Jesus is going to say, I don't know you. They're going to say, but I was saved. And he goes, you said a prayer. You didn't have a relationship. First Timothy chapter four, verse one. I don't know if I gave these guys, these to you, added these last. So if the media team could add first Timothy chapter four, verse one, real quick. I want to, if you have your Bible, we have Bibles in front of every chair, blue Bibles. You can open it up to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Here it goes. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, everybody say later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. If they're going to abandon the faith, that means at one point they were in the faith. How can you abandon something that you're never personally connected to in the first off? Does this make sense? So the thought process, if I say a prayer, I'm saved for the rest of my life, is not true. Because even the Bible says you can be in the faith and abandon it and be deceived by demonic spirits. Colossians chapter 1 verse 21. I'm going to give you guys a second to bring that up. Is everybody still following me so far today? Yeah. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. I'll go ahead and read it. It says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free of accusation. Everybody say the word if. If indeed you continue in your faith, established firm, not moving from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel. If you, um, if you heard, and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. I want to jump back real quick. It says this. There's the word if in there. It says, if indeed you continue in your faith, 
established firm, not moving from the hope head out in the gospel. That leads me to believe that you, and it's kind of like this. I heard somebody say like this too. It's like you're married to somebody. You fall in love with this person. You both fall in love with each other. You're married to them. You love. But over time, something happens and you no longer love each other. You're no longer married. And then you become roommates. And then you get a divorce. The question is, well, were they married to be, in the, the, you know, did they really love each other in the beginning? Yes, they loved each other in the beginning. But the Bible says, draw close to me and I will draw close to you. It goes the same way. You can draw close to God. You can walk away from God. It's free will. Free will works both ways. I can accept Jesus in my life. I can live for him. And then I can immediately reject him. And then somebody's going to say, well, they were never saved to begin with. I disagree. All right. Romans chapter 11, verse 20. If you can pull this up for me, Romans chapter 11, verse 20. All right. There we go. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by your faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. Let's keep going. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Let's keep going. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fail, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness, otherwise you will also be cut off. Who's going to cut you off? Not the devil. Your decision through the devil is going to cause God to cut you off. Is everybody with me? Yes. All right, let's keep going. I want to hit something else. Are you still with me? Please, yes. There's, the spirit of religion says this. If you come to church, you have to look a certain way and you have to dress a certain way. Religion can even hold, can even control people through false holiness. I had this vision, as I put this message together, somebody was unwrapping this present. The present was wrapped in white paper and had a black word, holiness. As they opened up and took off the paper, underneath that was a black box that, that let me make sure I say this right. It was a black box that said bondage and white. I want you to know that Jesus cares more about what happens in your heart than he cares what you wear on your, on your body. Yes. It's not what you wear that makes you holy. It's what happens in your heart. Yes. Can we establish that right now? Yes. Some churches will say, you know, like, you have to wear a suit. You have to have this. You have to look like this. You can't wear makeup, all that stuff. You know what that's called? It's called modern-day religion. That's exactly what it is. I could wear a suit and still be a pervert. I can wear a suit and still break the content commandments. You think Jesus is going to say, is that James Avery? What type, wait, what type of suit are we talking about here? Like what? I'm trying to think of the suit place here in town. I can think of it. There's, a, there's certain churches that say you have to have permission to buy a certain car. You have to have permission to buy a house. You have to have permission on who you're going to marry. And it has to go through the pastor. I want to tell you that. That's not biblical. That's demonic. That's called religion. And there's a spirit of control, I promise you, that is working in churches today to control people and hold them back from freedom. I want to hit one other thing, too. I'm going to hit two things real quick, and then we might do a part two later. But... Jesus, there's a, there's a domination that talks about Jesus only, connected to holiness. It's a false teaching. I'm going to say this. They say the Holy Spirit's Jesus, Jesus is Jesus, God the Father is Jesus. You know what happens is you'll have pastors who aren't spiritual fathers because they don't even recognize that there is a spiritual father. I'm, I'm telling you this just to let you know this is how the spirit of religion works. It wants to control what you think, 
wants to control what you buy, wants to control what you wear, and it wants to gauge everything in your life. It wants to constrict you to where you look to man for approval instead of looking to God for approval. But I'm here to tell you, you can, okay, not like, I'm not saying go out and wear booty shorts everywhere you go. And you know, like your body is a temple. Amen? I just got a really weird image. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. God sanctifies you, but some denominations say, no, you've got you've to come a certain way first before God does anything. You've got to look a certain way before God does anything inside. That's not how it works. You follow the Lord, the Holy Spirit will bring conviction. He'll change people. It's not my job to shove religion down people's throat and tell them they need to change from certain things. Amen. All right. The spirit of religion is also connected to competition that pivots churches against each other churches. The devil is really good at dividing and conquer, pointing one church against each other. And the spirit of religion will say that your church is better than that church. That only the people in this church are saved. If there's a domination that says only people in this church are saved, false religion, that's demonic. Don't go there. Amen? Amen. Religion's goal is for people to get hurt in the church so they never walk through the doors again. And this is one thing I want to end on, and then we'll, we'll, pivot, we'll pivot. And I want to pray over people who have been affected by religion. Is this starting to open up anybody's eyes? Yes. First off, if you've been hurt by the church, I want to say I'm sorry. That was not Jesus. That was man. This morning, I heard the Lord begin to speak to me about a new church model that's being created, and it's called Cave Church. I was like, well, what are you talking about, Lord? He said, there's Cave Church being created from people who have experienced spiritual abuse from pastors and elders and churches. And so they run into caves, and they find other people that have been abused, and they make the commitment, we're never going to go back to the church again. And this is going to be our church. The problem is there's no accountability, they're not under authority, there's no one leading them, and they become a dead sea where water flows in but nothing flows out. Cave churches are not concerned about the Great Commission. They're about their frozen chosen. It's a Christian country club, us for and no more. A church that's alive will always lead people to Jesus. You're going to see people saved. You're going to see people set free. You're going to see them lift the name of Jesus, and they're going to shine bright for Jesus. Amen? Amen. Be careful of cave churches. Does this make sense at all? Yes. How can you fulfill the Great Commission in a cave? I was like, God, where is this in the Bible? He said that David, his spiritual father, Saul, pushed him, attacked him. He ran to a cave. But God never called David to live in a cave. He called him to live in a palace. And it's like people that are abused, like you were abused, I were abused. Yeah, they're the enemy. And here's another thing God began to speak to me about this spirit of religion. You know the story where Solomon, there's two ladies that bring their baby to Solomon. And then they both said they're the mom. And Solomon says, okay, what's what we're going to do? We're going to cut the baby in half. We'll give one half to you and one half to the other. One of the moms says, no, don't cut the baby in half. The other mom says, yes, cut the baby in half. Solomon is able to, okay, I know who the true mother is, the one that wants to protect the baby. People that are leaving the church have this mentality, destroy the baby, cut it in half, and start all over again with the church. But God's heart is don't kill the baby, let's resurrect it, and I still have a plan for it. The spirit of religion will strip the saints of the power of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's as if this happens every Sunday. Say, I have, I have two brothers, and we're all really close. And say a guy comes to me and says, Landon, I want to send you and one of your brothers on the amazing trip, the trip of a lifetime. Okay, I'm going to spend millions of dollars. You guys take this trip. It's going to be awesome. 
I want you guys to go, but I only, I only want to do it for you and Lindsay. I don't want to do it for your brother, Lauren. Now, it would be a really hard conversation to have with Lauren, saying, Lauren, I'm sorry, me and Lindsay, my other brother, we're going to go on this vacation, but you're not allowed to go. I'm getting somewhere here. This is what happens every Sunday. God the Father, you're invited. Jesus, you're invited. Holy Spirit, we don't want you here. And we wonder why people aren't getting saved. We wonder why people aren't getting healed. Jesus says it's to your advantage that I go because the helper is coming called the Holy Spirit. You let the Holy Spirit, you let him move, anything he's in will automatically grow. A byproduct of the Holy Ghost, it's a one-part plan, let the Holy Spirit move. You want to see church growth model? It's called Acts Holy Spirit Come. When the Holy Spirit comes, you won't have enough room to contain people. There's church conferences, and you can have 20 different ways to grow your church. Not all of them are wrong, but if it's, if it's absent of the Holy Spirit, something's wrong with that. The, the religious spirit, its job is to kick the Holy Spirit out and to create theology that the Holy Spirit's not needed. His gifts still don't move. They're not wanted here. Amen? And many times we treat the Holy Spirit like a stepchild and push him in the back room. But not here. Here we say, Jesus, Holy Spirit, you are welcome to have your way. Do whatever you want to do. And I just declare right now the spirit of religion is not welcome, not just in this church, but in our lives in Jesus' name. I want to show you a church that didn't have the Holy Spirit. Okay? Acts chapter 3, verse 2. It said, there at the temple gate called uh, Beautiful Gate, a man who was crippled his whole life, every day he was carried to the gate to beg for money from the people going into the temple. So he's been crippled his whole life. He's probably been begging there for years. The man saw Peter and John going to the temple and asked for money. Peter and John looked straight at him and said, look at us. The man looked at him, uh, thinking they were going to give him some money. But Peter said, I, have, I haven't had any silver or gold, but what I do have, I have something else I'll give to you. By the power of Jesus of Nazareth, stand up and walk. Peter uh, took the man's right hand, lifted him up. Immediately, the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped up, stood to his feet, and began to walk. He went to the temple with him, walking and jumping and praising him. All the people recognized him as the crippled man. Who are all these people? The church. The church recognized this is a man that needed a miracle. But nobody flowed in the Holy Spirit power to see him healed. But yet, Peter, here, you know, obviously, Peter and John came. As the people recognized him as a crippled man who had always sat the beautiful gate begging for money, now they saw this man walking and praising, and they were amazed. They wondered how this could happen. While the man was holding on to Peter and John, all the people were amazed and ran to them um, at Solomon's porch. I just want you to know when the Holy Spirit's in the room, People won't stay crippled. They get healed. That's what happens. I still believe it. I see it. We walk in it. And as a believer, you should see it. You should walk on it. You're going to lay hands on the sick and they will recover. If you don't believe that God wants to use you to heal somebody, that's a religious spirit stopping you from belief. It is. You don't believe God wants to use you to deliver somebody. That's a religious spirit. God wants to use you. The Bible says, these signs shall follow those that believe. Who are you? Who, are there any believers in the house this morning? That means you. Turn to your neighbors. He's talking about you. Lift your hands up. Say, Holy Spirit, anoint these hands to see people healed. Anoint these hands to see people delivered. Fill me, Lord, with the fresh fire of the Holy Spirit this morning. Come on, get somebody, get the Lord some praise right now.
Ivan Tuttle is a guy that we're talking about. He's going to be a guest speaker here at the church, but I've talked about him before. He died for three days. God took him to hell. God took him to heaven. God brought him back to life. Amazing testimony, amazing book he has. But he says when he was in hell, he said hell was filled with lukewarm believers. Hell was filled with lukewarm believers, believers that, that said a prayer, but they never had a relationship. And I'm not, I'm not here to tell you, like, an easy gospel. I want to hear it's the, true, it's the true gospel. Amen? Like, we're not, the Bible says pick up your cross and follow me. They, Jesus said if they persecute me, they're going to persecute you. But we've painted this picture through the spirit of religion. Hey, just say a prayer, check the box. You're good. We'll see you in heaven. Have your best life now. What I think is going to happen is I think there's a revival about to hit. There's an awakening happening in the church. God's opening up people's eyes. And I think God's going to fill us with a fresh fire. And then when God fills you with a fresh fire, people in your family won't even recognize you. And when God opens up doors for you, lay hands on the sick, you're not going to back down. You're not going to cower. The spirit of fear isn't going to intimidate you. But you're going to run after everything God's called you to run after. Amen? Stand with me, if you will. You. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 10. You can throw that up. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 10. says, I've got a different version, so I'm going to read my version here. It's a different translation. It says, it's 5 through 10 through 16. It says, wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead. Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days we're living in is evil. I hear the Lord Jesus saying, wake up, sleeper. Wake up, disciple. I've got big plans for you. I'm going to use you to bring revival into places. I'm going to use you to see people healed, saved, raised from the dead. Lord, I just thank you that you're pushing people out of their comfort zones right now. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, that the spirit of religion is going to be broken out of people's lives. If you're here today, if we'd have someone on the keys, if you're here today and you see, you know, Landon, as you were speaking, some of the things you're speaking really spoke to me. I feel like the spirit of religion has really attacked me or attacked my family. And sometimes when you've grown up, and some of these theologies we've talked about, you have to like uninstall all the hardware. And it's hard sometimes to take, it takes time to unlearn all these things that we've learned over years. But I believe as we pray over people, God can do it in a moment. God can touch people's minds. He can touch their hearts, and something supernatural can happen. Amen? If you're here and you've been abused by somebody in the church, by a pastor, a leader, a teacher, whatever, I hear the Lord saying he wants to heal you this morning. He wants to bring healing in your heart. And he's going to, I really believe he's going to give you a fresh love for his bride. Everybody bow your heads with me. Holy Spirit, we just ask you to move across this room. I ask you, Lord. Speak to us, Lord. Ask the Holy Spirit this. Say, Holy Spirit, is there a Pharisee in me? What does that look like? Criticism, slander, control. If you've been kind of squirming a little bit during this message, that could be an indication. 
that a religious spirit is not happy. If you're here, you say, you know what? I think that I've been attacked by the religious spirit and I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give an altar call for two things. People who want to break the power of any religious spirit out of your life and out of your family. And number two, people who want to be healed from past trauma you found in the church. If that's you, I want you to come down to the front right now. God's not going to force healing in your life. He's not going to force freedom in your life. If you're here and you have an issue with gossip and slandering other believers, that's a sign. It's a religious spirit. We'd love to pray over you. If we could have our prayer team come forward. Also, if you're here, you say, you know what? I just feel like I've just realized... I've been going to church my whole life and I've had a relationship with church but never with Jesus. I feel like I need to have a relationship with Jesus. I've been going through the motions my whole life but I don't have a relationship with Jesus. How do you know you have a relationship with Jesus? Well, he talks to you throughout the week. You feel convicted by the Holy Spirit. You spend time with him outside of Sunday mornings. If that's you, we want to pray for you as well. Prayer team. Here in a second, we're going to start praying. I'm going to do a generic prayer, then I want you guys to go and lay hands and begin to anoint and pray over people. Amen. Jesus, we just right now plead the blood over every person in this room. And I thank you, Lord, that you're bringing freedom, freedom, freedom into our lives. And I declare healing, 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 God, from the past. Jesus, by your stripes, we are healed. And I pray, Lord, right now you even heal people from past hurts, past abuse, past trauma that's happened regarding people in your church. Prayer team, some of you might need to walk people through forgiveness. Thank you. In Jesus' name.